Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Jack Forehand is a principal at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, we sit down with our good friend Adam Butler. When we published our episode with Med Faber a few weeks ago that focused on things Med believes about investing that most of his peers would disagree with, we asked our followers on Twitter to respond with some of their own. The most thoughtful response we got came from Adam when he wrote the idea that an edge is indistinguishable from noise over a typical investing lifetime. We found that so interesting that we wanted to have Adam on to discuss it. We dig into that question in detail and cover many more interesting topics, including return stacking, the impact of passive investing, whether AI will boost economic growth, and a lot more. Adam always brings a thoughtful perspective to the topics we discuss with him, and I think you will find that he certainly delivered that in this episode. Thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Adam Butler. Adam, welcome back to Excess Returns. I love coming on with you guys. You know, Jack always sends me this list of topics and questions in advance, which is very thoughtful. Um, And they're very thoughtful questions. Um, So I'm excited to dig into what we're going to talk about today. Well, that, that's why we love having you because we can almost throw anything at you and we know it's, we're going to get some thoughtful insights and, you know, maybe some contrarian views on certain beliefs or things that investors might, uh, I guess, be thinking or believe in. So, you know, today we're going to tackle um, the idea of um, alpha and edge. We'll get into um, return stacking and what goes into that. And you guys are seeing some nice growth in the ETFs that are utilizing that investment strategy. And then hopefully toward the end, if we have time, we'll, um, you know, there's been, we've had a, a couple of guests on where these interesting things are coming up in terms of market structure and so, sort of what's influencing the markets. And so, you know, hopefully we can get into to some of that with you because I think you'll have some, some really interesting thoughts there. Um, but we wanted to start with, so we had Meb Faber on recently And the whole entire podcast was about kind of going through a set of beliefs that he has that most investment professionals or most peers would disagree with. And in response to that podcast, which was great, you threw this up on Twitter, you know, and I'm not going to read the whole tweet, but it's around an edge in investing. And the, the, the first sentence of that tweet was, the edge is indistinguishable from noise in your lifetime. So let's just start there about investing edge and kind of what you meant by that. Yeah, so edge is, um, I guess, skill. Um, and it probably correlates pretty strongly with what people typically think of, of uh, as alpha. But it's the idea that you're able to identify mispricings in, uh, in markets and generate profits in excess of, um, what you can get from just investing in standard benchmarks. And, um, yeah, my point with that is that for any given edge where, and let's say we'll call an edge in stock picking, um, you know, there's, there's maybe an edge in trying to emphasize stock to your portfolio with, um, high cash flow yield or high shareholder yield or, or positive momentum, that sort of thing. Um, that the size of these edges are so small, uh, relative to the noise around those edges that we experience every day in terms of their you know, relative gy- gyrations to um, the underlying indices, that it's it's just very difficult to make informed choices in advance that you can have high confidence. In other words, you're going to choose which edges you want to allocate to in your portfolio that you're going to have a high confidence will have outperformed you know, a a random set of other edges that you might have or strategies that you might have selected instead uh, if you were to observe the performance of this, the portfolio you've curated versus the set of kind of random portfolios of equal size that you might have selected instead over the next 10, 20, 30 years of your investment horizon. What do you think that means then for 
everyone out there that is trying to pursue this idea of generating alpha? I mean, how can investors have confidence or should they not have confidence in these strategies that are trying to seek out some type of edge? And how, how, how would you address that? Well, there's a, there's a sort of distinction between um, alphas and strategies, but let's just call them sort of um, things that you can allocate to in a portfolio, right? So what can you allocate to? You can allocate to um, indices like the S&P 500 or uh, the Bloomberg Ag uh, or a commodity index, or you, could, or you can allocate to foreign stocks, or you can wrap all global equities up in a single allocation. So these are things that, you know, people typically think of as core holdings and portfolios. What else can you allocate to? Well, you can allocate to, if you kind of want to separate out um, the distinctive characteristics of uh, a, a stock portfolio that emphasizes stocks with high momentum or strong value characteristics or high profitability or these types of um, characteristics that have historically been associated with long-term um, growth above what the market has provided. Um, or you can try to allocate to those, uh, those strategies in a long, short context and sort of think about what in the academic literature we might call alpha-beta separation, which is try kind of what we try to get at in our return stacked uh, ETF complex. But the idea being that you've got this momentum strategy and you've got this equity strategy. Most people typically kind of commingle them. They buy a long, a long only portfolio of high momentum stocks, right? So what do you get there? Well, you're sort of packaging up market beta. You've got kind of this long exposure to equities in general, and you've got some amount of exposure to the momentum strategy or factor because you're trying to emphasize high momentum stocks, right? So alpha beta separation says that, well, ultimately, well, ideally what you'd want is to get pure exposure to that momentum factor via a long short portfolio where you're long the highest momentum stocks and short the most negative momentum stocks. And so you're kind of market neutral, right? And so that's not contaminated by any long exposure to equity beta, so to speak. And then you're going to stack that on top of your long equity exposure, right? So see, th the idea is you want to get access to these other strategies, but I don't think about this momentum overlay or this momentum edge or strategy as being any different than an, e a, an equity beta strategy, right? So you, in your portfolio, you can hold equities and you can hold momentum. What else can you hold? You can hold value. You can hold size. You can hold profitability. You can hold trend. You can hold carry. You, you know, you can hold um, convertible arbitrage or um, merger arbitrage. You've got all these different kind of alphas or, you know, edges that are mostly uncorrelated with one another and with the the factors or uh, allocations that we all know and love, like equity beta and bond beta. And ideally, you want to add these all to a portfolio. But then the question becomes, well, there's a near infinite variety of ways you can define value strategies or momentum strategies or trend strategies or whatever, right? And so investors are left with both, well, what general ideas or concepts do I want to allocate to in the portfolio? And then beneath that, what methodology to get exposure to those factors or strategies do I, do I want to choose, right? And so what I'm trying to get at with my, with my point here is that it, it is very difficult to look at a set of potential strategies that you could allocate to, including equities, including bond beta, but also including trend strategies, carry strategies, value, momentum, et cetera, and make a choice ex ante of the portfolio that you want to create from those that is likely, you know, but that doesn't include all of them, that is likely ex ante 
to outperform a strategy of just choosing all of them, right? And there's, because the edges are so noisy that over an investor's lifespan or investment horizon of call it 30, 40 years, there's, there's no way that you'll be able to um, make a strong statistical case, even after 30, 40 years, that your, the specific portfolio that you chose was better than, you know, just trying to get access to all of the different strategies in your portfolio that you think that, that you reasonably believe in, right? So let's just, you know, find as many reasonable exposures that you can get into your portfolio and add as many of those as is possible given, you know, what is actually available to you, given your, where you are in the investment universe, right? Obviously, institutions have access to a much wider variety of strategies than a typical retail investor, though, you know, that gap has closed dramatically over the last five or 10 years as uh, asset management shops have launched various ETFs and mutual funds that attempt to approximate the type of strategies that um, institutions have always had available to them and make them available to retail investors in a package that they can buy and that they can mostly understand at a reasonable price. So that's a real win for all investors. Well, and, and I think you were, you, you had mentioned before you jumped on live here that um, you were in the process of like developing or coding something up that kind of demonstrated this. So maybe it's not totally ready yet, but yeah. like how, how were you tackling this like mathematically or statistically? There's some really great databases that um, some academics have made available. One of them is on the Q Factor site. Um, she and Zhu, I think, um, who, who uh, you know, wrote the paper on, on the Q Factor model uh, as an alternative to, say, Fama French. And they made available about 180 strategies grouped into different ways to uh, run momentum or value or profitability or trading frictions or liquidity, that sort of thing. Um, so you've got kind of 180 odd uh, strategies with daily returns uh, that have all been written about and demonstrated to have statistical significance by the academic community over, you know, say the last 30, 40 years of publications. <clears throat> and so an interesting experiment is, well, let's sort of randomly, let's, let's, let's examine the performance of these 180 different factors from say, uh, when most of them start in the data that's provided in the late 1960s until say, you know, the late 1980s or the late 1990s. So over sort of a 20, 30 year horizon, right? And then based on the performance of all of these different strategies, now you are charged with choosing a portfolio of 10 strategies out of those 180 strategies after looking at 30 years of performance, right? So, you know, typically people might look through that data and say, well, you know, um, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick the ones with the highest sharp ratio, the top 10 with the highest sharp ratio or the top five with that delivered the highest Kager or something like this, right? There's a, a variety of different metrics you might use. Maybe you'll evaluate it on some Pareto frontier of a combination of different metrics, right? Whatever. And then you hold that portfolio over the next 10, 20, 30 years and examine how that portfolio that, that you selected performed against all of the other portfolios that you may have selected, right? From that group of 180 um, potential strategies. And, you know, can you identify any set of metrics that you can use as evaluation criteria that will allow you to choose a basket of all 180 portfolios that will go on and have a high probability of outperforming any random basket of 
strategies that you might have chosen instead of the one that you chose, right? And, you know, evaluating where the, the, the ones that you selected lie on that distribution will give you some intuition even after, keep in mind, you've got a 30-year evaluation horizon here and you're going to go ahead and hold it for another 20, 30 years, right? So a lot of people, I think, might intuit that, well, I've got 30 years of history. I think I'm, I'm, I can be pretty confident that the ones that have the highest sharp ratios are going to, you know, go on and be in the top half of the all potential strategies that I might have picked. And what you see, in fact, is that that's not true, that it ends up being, right, pretty well in the median, right? So if I'm going to select 10 and then I, I generate a thousand alternative portfolios of 10 different strategies, well, on average, if I run this simulation many, many times, you're at about the median. But why am I choosing 10? You know, why wouldn't I choose 20 or 30? And it turns out that if you choose 20, randomly choose 20 instead of curating 10 based on their historical performance, then your curated 10 on expectation will perform worse than or your random 20. And the random 20 will perform, you know, the, the curated 20 will perform worse than your random 30, right? The message being there, and then again, this is like a bit of a constrained simulation, but it does demonstrate that trying to make decisions ex ante, even over long time horizons, you end up not outperforming a simple strategy of, of just trying to get to allocate to as many different strategies as possible and take advantage of the diversification opportunities that are available. Because your skill in selecting strategies in advance, based on even very long histories of performance is pretty close to zero. It would seem to me, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it would seem to me like this is why the pod shops operate the way they do. They've got a bunch of people who think they have edge. They put them all together. They manage the exposures around that. And, and then they have a much better chance of producing alpha over the long term doing it that way. I think the pod shops, so I think there's something to that. I also think there's something to the fact that the pod shops are really looking for people that genuinely have alpha. So I think it's useful to kind of distinguish between what we might call sort of systematic factor strategies and alpha, right? So I would distinguish it as alpha comes from somebody who has very particular niche insight or information or experience within a fairly narrow domain of the market. So for example, um, we have a client who allocates to a municipal bond manager. Now this manager, he's got a hard cap at about a billion dollars. Um, the team that runs it spun out of what used to be the largest um, muni market making desk, um, worked there for 20, 30 years. What did that give them? Well, it gave them access to and knowledge of where all of the flows from muni bonds, you know, all of the issuance from muni bond, from the muni bond sector coming from the different state governments, who are the decision makers there, you know, how can get, they get inside information on what type of issuance is coming down the pipe. Um, and then being at the center of flows of, of the, the muni market, which is a very niche segment of the market, right? I think, and that's just one example, but there are many examples. For example, somebody who works in for 20 years in the electricity markets, right? And electricity is a very nuanced pricing um, market with a very small number of key players and is largely driven by changes in regulations at the state level and the county level. And so having very specialized knowledge of that from having worked and having experience inside the sector gives you a real edge, right? So these are the types of, of, um, of strategies and people that the pod shops are looking for, right? Now, you know, these typically tend to be fairly illiquid strategies, right? You can't have a, 
you can have Elliott Management, a $71 billion firm that's running, just running an electricity, niche electricity strategy, right? Or a niche muni strategy. But the goal is to find hundreds of people who are all running, you know, these niche little strategies that will all require liquidity to take advantage of opportunities at completely different times from one another and putting them all together in a diversified basket, right? Now, I'm sure there are also like um, very scalable strategies in there as well that maybe are running lit more liquid equity strategies or, or li option strategies or whatever. But I, I fundamentally believe, and in, in my insights from knowing people at those shops is that the majority of the alpha that you can't get anywhere else at scale comes from, you know, the assembly of many different, uh, less liquid, small niche players that are all operating together in an ensemble within these pot shops. I want to ask you a couple other things about this idea that there is a lot of noise, even in very long-term returns. And you know, one of the things people like us have been struggling with is this idea is, is does the value factor still work? And I think this is kind of a related concept in the other direction, right? Because we're trying to say it doesn't work. And, you know, I think Corey showed in Factor Fimbo Winter, the amount of time we would need to show that is longer than our investing lifetime. So yeah, this sure. does become about faith, right? I mean, it becomes about the person running the strategy and their ability to make a decision because data is not going to tell them that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Value is a great example, right? Because, you know, if you look at a cross section of potential ways you could define value, whether it's kind of you know, based on book value or, or um, cash flow yield or what have you, you know, more than half of those academic definitions of value have underperformed, um, you know, have like negative alpha over the last 20, 30 years. And um, so what ends up happening, of course, is that both practitioners and academics end up kind of modifying their definitions of value over time in order to sort of preserve the um, veracity or, you know, faith in, in the strategy. Um, and, I, you know, I have no specific opinion on value. It has just as compelling evidence uh, as any of the other strategies that you might consider typically to hold in the portfolio alongside other strategies, right? But there's a really good case for where if you looked at the, and we've got good data on, you know, on value portfolios, I think that goes back to the 1800s now, but certainly back to the 1930s. We've had that for a couple of decades, like even 80 years where um, even like your median value strategy in terms of all the different potential definitions had a sharp ratio of in the neighborhood of kind of 0.4, like a really high information ratio um, and then sort of post 1990, it basically flatlined, right? So you've got 50 years, 60 years, 70 years of like the T stat is just ridiculous, right? And yet over what I think most people would agree is a time horizon that's about 10 times longer than most investors have patience for an underperforming strategy, right? Typically investors like 90th percentile patience is like three years, right? So, you know, you've got like 30 years of underperformance, just no investor is going to, to stick with that. And the only reason why anyone is still investing in the value strategy, except for, you know, a handful of academics and people who have actually done their own research on it, I think, is because for the most part, it's been commingled and kind of diluted against a broad, against the broad equity beta, right? So, cause, cause most people are getting their value exposure by holding kind of like a value tilt on a broad, you know, larger mid cap, uh, equity portfolio and the equity beta itself has done so well, right? So people don't kind of notice so much that the value tilt hasn't added any value over the last 30 years. Again, I'm not saying it won't, go on to add tremendous value over the next 30 years. In fact, you know, gun to my head, I think value is probably poised to maybe have a renaissance because so many people are now disillusioned by it, right? You've just got, 
you know, most of the flows over the last 10 or 15 years have been out of concentrated value funds and into either cap weighted beta or some other factor strategy that has been, you know, doing something for people more lately, right? And as a, as a function of that, what we've seen, and I think um, our friend Ned posted a really good chart from GMO recently that shows that, you know, the, the, the really deep value stocks in the U.S. are still showing extremely good value relative to their history, while, you know, pretty well every other value quintile is expensive, right? So those who are really big believers in value this is probably a really good time to double down on it. The problem is, you know, a lot of people who people listen to for good reason have been saying people should double down on value like every couple of years for the last five or 10 years. And it, except for a, a surge in kind of 2022, it's just been a real disappointment, right? So it just takes a lot of faith. And that's why I say you really can't make any decisions over your lifetime related to or, or based on the performance that you observe, rather you should take advantage of that free lunch of diversification and create as much diversification in your portfolio as possible. And, you know, just allocating to these kind of value tilted or momentum tilted commingled equity portfolios you get very little of diversification that, that you might seek into these other types of strategies, which is why this alpha beta separation, I think is so important. And you know, why we think this return stacking concept, which institutions have been taking advantage of for so many years, um, is an idea whose time has come for, for retail. Yeah, and on that idea of diversification, I wanted to ask you about, I had Jason Buck on a podcast and I interviewed him recently, and we were talking about this idea he was challenging the idea of stocks for the long run. And we talked about the long-term data. And I think over 100 years or whatever it is, the U.S. has something like 6.5% real returns. Global stocks has something like 5. I mean, I might be a little bit off on that, but I'm, I'm probably in the general area. So a lot of people will look at that and say, that's 100 years of data. Like, I have to expect that that's telling me a lot about what's going to happen in the future. I mean, a period that long. But you don't think that's necessarily true, right? Oh, I, I definitely don't. I mean, I think the best estimate of any single stock market. Uh, so let's take the U.S. for example, right? How would I estimate the expected return of the U.S. of U.S. equities? I would probably, you know, I would probably go back and run a large variety of simulations uh, of all portfolios that cumulatively sum up to approximately fifty percent of global market cap. Uh, at any point in time, and then observe the median performance of those portfolios. And then I would shrink that toward the global average. Uh, so I would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, somewhere between three and a half and 5% um, annualized excess return for U.S. equities. Unconditional. So if they were trading near their median historical valuation, but they're not trading anywhere near their median historical valuation, they're trading, you know, depending on how you measure it, somewhere between 50 and 100% above their median historical valuation. And so even if you make the case that the average valuation over time should rise to reflect the fact that markets are more liquid, you've got lower trading frictions, you've got a longer history, so you can gain more confidence in the expected premium, et cetera. So, you know, I could kind of buy the argument that maybe you should have a slow creep of, of uh, equilibrium PE expansion over time. But even if you run a regression on that, a increase in PE ratios going back to the early 1800s, you're still at about a 50% overvaluation relative to even that adjusted uh, PE ratio. So adjusting for the fact that we expect PE ratios to be higher today than they were in the 1800s, for example, right? So, you know, 
condition on the fact that markets are expensive, I personally would expect, you know, U.S. equities to probably underperform their long-term average over the next kind of 15 to 20 years. I say 15 to 20 years because if you look back through history, that tends to be the horizon over which we do see this kind of cyclical reversion. There's a huge, you know, variance around that horizon. And we've only had, you know, 10 or 15, 15 year uh, non overlapping periods through history to gain any statistical confidence on this. So, you know, th there's a lot of noise here, but, you know, a, a decent guess would be kind of a reversion to somewhere near the P, the, the uh, expansive adjusted PE ratio over the next 10 to 20 years. And at the same time, you know, global equities maybe are trading a little bit below their average valuation. Oh, some of them, some markets are trading well below, and those are likely to, to outperform U.S. equities over the same horizon. So that leads really well into return stacking, which you already introduced, but I wanted to dig into more. But first, I wanted to define some terms. Um, there's a term that's been around for a long time, portable alpha. Is that the same thing as return stacking? I thought it was pretty similar, but then I asked Claude, who, who could potentially be Hindu hallucinating, and told me all these differences. So uh, are those basically the same thing? Well, we certainly think of it as being very similar, right? I mean, the whole idea of portable alpha uh, for institutions. So there's kind of two ways to run it. One is you can take your kind of um, core portfolio of equities and bonds. And because many institutions uh, don't suffer from, from tax issues, right? Um, they're tax exempt. They can allocate to um, derivatives uh, for their core exposure. So for example, allocate to S&P 500 futures and, and various uh, treasury bond futures to get their core uh, equity risk premium and duration premium, right? So that doesn't consume very much capital. Let's say that a, an, institu an institution's got $100 in capital that they need to deploy, getting a hundred percent, getting, you know, exposure to a 60, 40 portfolio of equities and bonds using futures consumes less than 5% of that capital just because of the way that you get leverage in the futures markets. You've only got to post a small amount of the total notional value of the, of, of the futures that you're, that you're buying in order to get that exposure, right? So now you've got $95 that you can allocate to things like private equity and, uh, and real estate and, um, and hedge funds, as an example, right? So that's one way to do it. And that's a, a fairly common way to do it. Another way to do it is to have kind of a core allocation to your, your equities and bonds, um, by buying cash equities and buying a, you know, owning a, a credit portfolio, cash equity portfolio directly, and then using that portfolio to collateralize. In other words, you're borrowing against that portfolio, either borrowing against it directly, almost like a margin loan, so that like a Goldman Sachs will say, well, we'll accept this, you know, we'll accept $70 of that hundred dollars of equity and bond uh, collateral as, as collateral against, you know, will lend you $70. And then you can take that $70 and you can go to pull it to private equity or, or hedge funds or what have you, right? Uh, or you can run your portable alpha overlay as you're, you're holding cash equities, cash credits, and then you're using those to collateralize a futures portfolio, right? In which case you don't need to go to the bank and say, hey, bank, can you loan me money against my equity and bond portfolio? Instead, you just sort of carve off a small amount. Maybe you're only $95 of your $100 is, in, is invested in cash equities and cash bonds. And you take that 5% and use that to collateralize a futures trading overlay, right? So the latter variety of portable alpha is closer to what we are doing in return stacking. 
So how do you think about what, you talked a little bit about some of these things before, but how do you think about what to stack on top? Like what are the characteristics of the types of strategies you'd want to pair with stocks and bonds? So in a retail context, I mean, in general, right, what you want to stack on top are strategies that uh, you expect to have low correlation with the underlying beta component of the portfolio that you are allocating to, right? So for example, you've got a uh, return stack portfolio where the the beta of that portfolio is trying to give you a kind of 100% exposure to U.S. equities. It's called the S&P 500, right? Um, so you want to stack on top a strategy that you expect to have a very low correlation with U.S. equities over time, right? So when you, because when you're adding that on top, you're implicitly using leverage, right? You've got nearly $100 that are already allocated to holding, let's say, an S&P 500 ETF, right? So you're, that's fully invested. So anything that you're running on top is necessarily providing, is done using leverage, right? So if you were to just stack another S&P 500 exposure right on top of that, well, now all you've done is double your risk, right? Yeah, you maybe double your expected return. That's not quite right, actually, because of the volatility drag. But you may be dub approximately doubling your expected return, but you're basically doubling your risk. You're not getting any diversification benefits. So that's not very helpful. So what you want to do is, is stack a strategy on top that in expectation has a very low zero or negative correlation to the U.S. equity component. If you're stacking bonds, you want to stack on top something that you expect to have lower negative correlation to the bond component, right? Um, now, that could be anything, right? An institution could go to a bank and say, I want to buy, um, I want you to run a portfolio of uh, long, short uh, U.S. equities. Well, what you run, you know, like a value, market neutral value factor portfolio or market neutral momentum factor portfolio or what have you, to run that directly in an ETF, you run up against borrowing constraints. The ETF structure will only allow you to borrow directly up to 30% of the value of the um, cash that's invested. So, if, you know, there's $100 invested in the ETF, you can borrow $30 and you can use that $30 to run a strategy. But that doesn't give you much latitude. If you're going to run a market neutral equity portfolio, typically the vol on that portfolio is extremely low. And the way that you generate, you know, you, you make it attractive is by levering it up very substantially. So you just can't run that kind of strategy in an ETF as a stacking component very easily because of this direct leverage constraint. In contrast, with futures, we can kind of just, you know, take 10% of the total value of the portfolio. So let's say we're, you know, we've got a, a stacking uh, product that wants exposure to the S&P 500 with something stacked on top. So you hold cash equities to the tune of, say, 80 or 90%. And then you've, you hold 10 or 20% in T-bills. You make up for that missing equity exposure by buying and rolling equity futures that have that, you know, 10 or 20% notional exposure to U.S. equities to top up. So now you're getting your 100% U.S. equity exposure that you want, but then you're also using that extra T-bill collateral to collateralize a futures trading strategy. And for the purpose of the regulatory constraints, the leverage on trading the futures is not, it's not considered the same as directly borrowing against the portfolio. And so you can effectively run a future strategy at a meaningful level of expected return and risk on top of, uh, you know, a full equity portfolio or a full bond portfolio under the regulatory constraints of a typical 40 act mutual fund or ETF structure. So, you know, that's why we tended to gravitate toward um, futures-based strategies or strategies that just don't require a lot of leverage. 
And that point on uncorrelated assets is a really important one because the, the idea of portable alpha got a bad rap in 2008. But I think what a lot of people were doing back then is they were stacking like hedge fund strategies, right? That had correlation to the market and also were very illiquid. They were stacking that on top of stocks and bonds and, and that can be very problematic. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. So I remember I said there's kind of two ways for institutions to run a portable alpha, right? One is to get your core exposure through futures and then to use the excess collateral to buy hedge funds and private equity and real estate, all that kind of stuff, right? So in that model, let's go to 2008. So you've got your, you know, let's call it 60% in equities via futures, 40% in bonds via, via futures. And now you're stacking kind of uh, 80 to $90 of uh, private equity, uh, real estate, and hedge fund exposure, maybe maybe credit exposure uh, on top. Coming in 2008, credit craters, equities crater. You're kind of hoping that your private equity, equity, um, your real estate equity, uh, and your hedge funds, which kind of have a 0 0.8, 0 0.7 beta to equity, are going to hedge your um you know, equity and bond exposure that you've got for futures. And of course, we learned that in a credit event or a major liquidity event, that most of these strategies are not really designed. They all kind of hurt you when it hurts most to be hurt, right? When, you're, um, when your core portfolio is in the gutter, sadly, a lot of these other exposures are in the gutter at the same time for the same reasons, right? Um, which is why it's so important that if you're going to run a portable alpha strategy, the leverage that you're taking to generate the excess return on top is not stacking risk in the same way that it's stacking returns. You want to stack, uh, a, call it a unit of returns, but only say half a unit of risk. Or a, or a third of a unit of risk, right? And the way that you do that is by stacking strategies on top that are structurally designed to have very low correlation to your core stocks and bonds allocation uh, during crisis periods like 2008, where it really hurts to be hurt if your diversified overlays are going in the same direction as your core portfolio. So just two more for me before I hand it back to Justin. I want to ask you about managed futures, which is, the, I think, the first thing you guys did um, when you stack something on top. One of the things I've, whenever I know, I know whenever I have you on, I can always ask these tough questions that I can't figure out the answer to. And, and this is one of them, because I've thought about this a lot. Like, if, if I'm running a managed future strategy, and I believe you guys are, are replicating an index, you can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But in general, if I'm running a managed future strategy and I'm coupling it with a stock and bond portfolio, I go back and forth on, do I want stocks and bonds in the managed future strategy or not? It seems like there's arguments in both directions and it seems like smarter people than me have argued both ways. So I'm just wondering, how, how do you think about that? Well, in an ETF structure, you, you want to be able to take advantage of the, you know, uh, basket redemption creation policy that the market makers provide, which shelter you from uh, accruing taxes within the ETF structure if you're trading cash um, cash equities in particular, right? So, you know, if, if you've got cash equities as your kind of core beta that you're going to then stack managed futures on, typically you want to have as much allocated to cash equities as possible so you can take advantage of these create redeems to mostly eliminate the the tax distributions that you would otherwise get every year, right? With bonds, it's a little bit less clear um, and the structure of the ETF and the types of bonds that you're trading make a bit of a difference. Uh, futures are taxed as 60-40. So actually, if, you're, if you've got bond futures and you're accruing gains from bond futures, most of the gains are more tax efficient than if you were to hold a cash bond, because of course the, the interest payments from the cash bond are taxed as regular income, 
whereas the gains from rolling bond futures are taxed as 60-40, so 60% long-term capital gains, 40% income. So you've got a nice little tax pickup there, right? Um, you know, there's, it just depends on the, the type of investor, investor and the type of structure. Like if you're in a mutual fund structure, then your equities are going to accrue capital gains. You're going to get distributions because there's no create redeem mechanism like there is for ETFs. Um, so you can't play fun games with taxes that way. Um, so there's a little bit less flexibility. But yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're a tax and exempt investor, then, you know, if you can achieve alpha beta separation, most, whatever the most efficient way to achieve that is best. If you're a retail investor in a taxable account, then it matters. And we try to structure the ETFs so that they're maximally tax efficient for, um, for retail investors. And the second thing you guys added after managed futures is something to stack on top is something I think less people will be familiar with. It's this idea of futures yield. Can you just explain what that is? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's also important to clarify that a lot of people equate the term managed futures with uh, a strategy that let's say most managed futures run within their fund, excuse me, which is trend following, right? Um, so trend following in futures, you know, you've got somewhere between call it 25 and in some cases, a couple hundred different global futures markets across equity indices, bond indices, uh, many, many different commodities and, and global currency markets uh, and some exotics sometimes. And um, you're effectively kind of, you're leaning into the phenomenon whereby the, when futures markets have gone up, over the last kind of three to 12 months, they're more likely than not to continue going up over the next few days or weeks, right? And so if you buy futures markets that have been rising uh, and, you sh and you sell short futures markets that have been going down, this is called trend following. And you know, historically, this has generated a very nice premium over time with near zero long-term average correlation with equities and bonds. Um, and commodities and, and currencies, but, but most people don't hold those in their portfolio. So they're less relevant. The managed futures. So managed futures doesn't always just mean trend following. It's kind of what I was going. So our carry strategy is also a managed future strategy. We're just using a different signal to decide which futures markets are more attractive or likely to go up over the next few days and weeks. Uh, we're not using trend. We're using call, something called futures yield, right? And so, you know, I always like to say that carry or futures yield is just the futures market's way of ensuring that there is no, there's no free money lying on the ground that banks or sophisticated traders can pick up without having to take any risk. And the, the reason I say this is that, well, carry in cash equities is the dividends that are paid out. You might argue it's the shareholder yield, maybe, right? If companies are, are buying back stock, that's a distribution that shareholders accrue, right? But either way, that's, you know, let's call it dividend yield just to keep it simple. So you've got dividend yield that's paid out and you get that dividend regardless of changes in the equity prices themselves, right? So and it's the same with interest payments on bond, right? Bond prices go up and down, but they pay a fixed interest payment. Um, so carry is just the return you expect to get from holding an asset if the price doesn't change, right? Regardless of what happens to price, you're going to get paid the dividend. It's going to get paid the interest. So a future that is benchmarked and transferable into the S&P 500, for example, at maturity, um, needs to price in the fact that if you hold the futures instead of holding the cash equities, that you're not getting a dividend yield in the future where, that you are getting in cash equities. So if the futures didn't price in the fact that you, you could get this if you hold, held the cash equities instead, somebody could 
could own the cash equities, short the futures, earn the dividend yield, and be assuming no price risk on the S&P 500, right? So to assure that doesn't happen, markets are generally efficient in this way, the futures need to um, trade at, when you buy the futures, they need to trade at a slightly lower price than the cash index that they track so that over time, as we approach the period when the futures are directly transferable into the cash index at maturity, that both the, both the futures and the cash index have provided the same return, including the dividend yield, right? So when futures are priced slightly below the level of the cash index, they are expected to then creep up over time, all things equal, so that those returns on the cash index and the futures are the same over the same time period, right? It's the same for bond futures. Bond futures are deliverable against a bond at maturity, and those bond futures need to give, provide approximately the same return as cash bonds over that time, including the distributions that were paid by those cash bonds, right? Well, ugh, commodities and currencies also have these carry characteristics, right? So a future tends to, to be priced either above or below the cash spot market. Why? Well, maybe, for example, in um, let's say you've got copper futures and you've got someone who is uh, looking to build a copper mine and they need to get financing. They need to raise a few billion dollars to go and build this copper mine. The copper mine may not be on stream for 10 or 15 years, right? If they did not sell the expected production from that copper mine forward, so they locked in the price that made sure that the copper that they're going to mine from that mine, ugh, 10 or 15 years from now, made that mine profitable, made the investment in that mine profitable, it would be more difficult for them to raise the capital to build the mine. And they either wouldn't be able to raise it or the cost of capital that they would pay in order to, to get the funds to build the mine would be unreasonably high. Whereas when they lock it in, they're able to go to lenders and say, all right, the expected ROI on this mine is X. I know this because I've sold forward a good chunk of my production and the, um, the, the people that are providing capital are then comfortable enough to give them a much lower rate on that capital, right? So the, the uh, producer who's building the mine wins, their shareholders win because they're able to go about their business operations with a lower cost of capital because the, there's a much lower variance in their expected cash flows because they've locked in the prices for the things that they're going to sell in the future, right? The question then is, well, who is insuring those prices for producers? And how much do they get paid for that, right? Well, they get paid, the speculators, like people that run carry strategies on commodities, they provide this price security for the producers. They basically sell this price insurance and they earn an insurance premium in the form of this uh, futures yield. All right. And there's a few other things that go into this um, for different commodities. It's, you know, there are different dynamics at play. Crops are affected by weather and um, oil is, it is impacted by storage uh, availability and demand and all kinds of stuff, right? But, you know, it, there are, the, the point is that the futures in the future trade at a different price than the spot price. And you're able to then take long positions in, in futures that are trading above the spot price. Because all things evil, we're expecting the, the price of those futures to fall towards the spot price over the time to maturity. And you want to buy futures whose price is currently below the spot price because you expect them to rise toward the spot price over that maturity, right? Now, importantly, that spot price is changing over time, right? So this is far from a guarantee. 
that if you're buying a future that's below the current spot price today, that you're going to earn a positive return on that because you're still taking price risk, right? But on average, that yield bears out, right? Just on a, like on average, that you do earn a positive dividend yield. You do, do earn a positive uh, interest rate, right? And so we're able to take advantage of this across equity indices, bond indices, a variety of commodities and currencies in order to generate this return on top of, stack on top of the, um, the core beta component, like stock equity uh, beta or bond beta um, to generate this kind of return stack profile. So just one last kind of point on this is you guys run five different ETFs at the current time. And one of the things that's, I think that that's impressive given we had an ETF and how hard it is to kind of grow assets. I mean, at this point, I think you guys are, you know, north of 750 million in terms of total assets. And the other cool thing is it's a lot of times you see these ETF families and it might be like all the assets are in maybe one or two strategies. But from my viewpoint, it looks like, you know, it's a nice mix. Investors are embracing different strategies within these ETF wrappers and the assets like aren't all in one thing. It's kind of in, you know, across, across the board in the mix. So it, that's, a, I think, a, a testament to what you guys have built and how these kind of stand out in what is a crowded, um, crowded space with ETFs. Thank you. I mean, the primary recognition here, well, I guess there were two, but the primary recognition here was that it's actually very hard for retail investors to, to get diversification's free lunch. Because traditionally, in order to add diversifying investments to a portfolio, you need to sell down the, your exposure to your core stocks and bonds. Um, so, you know, you're adding maybe sleeves of the portfolio that are uncorrelated to your stocks and bonds. The, the overall risk of your portfolio is maybe going down but your return is also going down, right? So you're, in other words, your portfolio may have a higher sharp ratio or a higher, it may be maybe more efficient. Um, but, you know, there's this old saying, you can't eat sharp ratio, right? And so that is true or has been true historically for most retail investors. You can, you can increase your sharp ratio, but only at the expense of lowering your risk and lowering your return. So what we said is, well, we want to provide investors an opportunity to be able to eat their higher sharp ratio by allowing them to keep full exposure to the core stock and bond exposures that they love um, so much. And then just stack these um, alternative uncorrelated strategies on top so that you can have your diversification and you can eat it too, hmm. right? So it's, um, you know, like the icing on the cake, you know, you're not having to like cut off, cut out a bunch of pieces of cake to slide something else in. You have the whole cake and then you've got this lovely icing layer on top that, um, that legitimately does give you much higher diversification. And for every extra percent of return that you expect to get, you're getting far less than a percent of extra risk in your portfolio, right? So you're able to, you know, expand your efficient frontier and eat that diversification's free lunch. Well, I have a good idea. Let's get, let's, the new tagline can be, you can eat your cake and have it too. And then we can put Corey on a rower and see how many calories he can burn in 60 minutes. <laughs> That's a good, yeah, I like that. Oh my God, I'm just uh, kidding. But he can burn a lot of calories in 60 minutes, so probably yeah. a whole marathon. Rowing crazy guy over there. But uh, okay, okay. so um, good stuff, Adam. We want to just sort of at the end here, maybe just get your thoughts on some of the things that have come up recently on excess returns with various guests. And the first thing we wanted to get your, and I mean, maybe we've, I don't think we've talked about this with you, which is, you know, Mike Green, you're familiar with Mike Green, obviously at Simplify. And um, I think maybe he's even been on your podcast. Um, and uh you know, his work around passive and how passive flows are influencing the overall market. Um, and then kind of coupling that with, I think it was David Einhorn, who was on Patrick O'Shaughnessy's Invest Like the Best, where, you know, he was making the point that, 
you know, fundamentals because of some of Mike Green's work, fundamentals are mattering less and less in the market because of these flows. And he's kind of changed his investment strategy to look for stocks that are returning capital uh, to investors through dividends and buybacks and things like that, rather than trying to invest based on the market recognizing the fundamental value of companies. Right. Yeah. I mean, so it, it has been a fundamental tenet of the academic canon on markets that um, markets will trade in equilibrium as a function of the expected discounted cash flows of, of the, uh, of the investments. Right. And, um, you know, Ben Graham, I think put it really well with in the short term, the market is, uh, um, uh, oh, what is it now? In the long term, it's a weighing machine in the short voting term. machine in the short run. It's yeah. a voting machine in the short run in the long term. It's, and I think, you know, that the thesis that Mike Green and Dave Einhorn and others are espousing here is that the constant flows during um, positive employment cycles, like we've, like we sort of experience, call it 17 out of every 20 years, um, are now effectively short circuiting the weighing machine, right? And so you only really, you only get, get to work with the voting machine. And I've had, I've had occasion, um, to chat extensively with Mike about this in private and in various venues and with others, you know, and, um, I am, I'm reasonably convinced that this is a very substantial, um, effect in market markets. I think it is amplified by, um, regulation and policy, for example, rules that set default investments for 401k plans, um, new rules introduced by the SEC that make it more difficult for investors to um, invest in diversifying strategies because you've got a, there's, there's more rigorous hurdles, regulatory hurdles you need to overcome and able, in terms of justifying why investors are paying high fees. And also policies that over the last 15 years and arguably over the last, you know, 30 odd years, has favored um, equity investors. So continue to kind of bail out an over-leveraged financial system, um, maybe imprudent equity managers and equity investors um, to constantly support an equity market because it now has become sort of de facto everybody's retirement plan and because other things are linked to it. Like, you know, there's now a very highly reflexive, if not inverted relationship between markets and the economy. It used to be, of course, that markets responded to um, growth or, or a lack of growth in the economy, right? Which provided for recessions that were markets corrected due to an expectation of lower earnings. I think it's reasonable to argue now that the, the market wags the, the, the economy's tail, right? So, you know, so much of lending now is a function, it is against assets instead of being against income that when asset markets crater, lending markets, or even, you know, go down a little bit, lending markets seize up, which is a de facto tightening of the financial system makes it harder to get loans and therefore tightens the economy as well. Excuse me. So, you know, for all of these different reasons, policymakers have needed, felt like they needed to step in and support equity and credit markets to a greater and greater extent over time. And so therefore there's all this sort of, um, you know, mindless flow on the long side into U.S. equities. And of course, they've, they've also had a performance run that is way outside expectation over the last 10 or 12 years as well, right? So all these factors mean that there's a, a huge proportion of the market that is just default allocating to equities over time. 
And if you read some of the literature on the price elasticity of demand for, uh, for equities, it's clear that, you know, if you've got uh, a stock with a market cap that is 10% of the market, like we've had, well, not quite 10%, or let's say 5% of the market, um, then 5% of all automatic flows into the market are going to go into that stock, right? Into a cap, cap weighted stock. So if, you know, the expectation is that a stock that has 5% of the market cap of the market will also have sufficient liquidity or liquidity equal to, in proportion, um, its market cap proportion. And what they found is that, in fact, that liquidity is not equal to what is expected by a market cap weighted index where people are just sort of automatically allocating to it on the long side. And as a result, every dollar that goes in is pushed, is disproportionately raising the prices of these stocks that represent a large portion of the index. Um, and that this is a compounding effect over time that in fact, there is no expectation that these ex the excess pricing that accrues from this phenomenon will equilibrate, right? And so, you know, this has distortionary effects on uh, on markets, which may reverse during recessions, right? Because a lot of these flows are coming from labor income. If labor income at the margin declines, then you know we may see actually these flows reverse at the margin, and you know. I think Mike Green has has posited that this might result in kind of a go to zero mo moment for uh, for equity markets, right? But we it doesn't need to be so awful as that as to imply that we probably should expect more and larger shocks as a result of these kinds of flows and the fact that the elasticity of demand for these biggest stocks in the index are not what is expected by equilibrium theory. One other thing I, w I wanted to ask you about, because I know you're an expert in this area and it's really interesting to me. Like we just had Aswat the Motor in on the podcast um, and he's been talking a lot about AI and he's a big believer in AI and what it's going to be, I think as all of us are, but he had also said like on a net basis, he doesn't think it really means anything for GDP growth. It, he thinks it'll kind of be what it's always been. There'll be winners and there'll, there'll be losers. And, and I thought you were a great person to ask that question. I mean, do you think this is something that stimulates GDP growth over time? Do you think it's something that is deflationary and refuses, like overall and decreases inflation over time? Like when you think about the overall economic impact of AI, how do you think about that? I'm pretty convinced that it's going to have a very substantial impact on productivity. Um, where we're mostly seeing those impacts now are in um, the developer community. So there are new tools on the market, um, like cursor and Ader and, and Zed, uh, or just, you know, uh, the chat GPT interface or, or Claude.ai interface where you can give a model instructions about, you know, what you want to do in code and it will write the code for you. And then you know, maybe it takes a couple of turns to kind of refine the code that is produced, but, you know, with a sufficient number of turns, it will eventually produce the, the full code working code for whatever application you are looking for. Now it's not yet at the level where it can write enterprise level code. The challenge with, with enterprise level code is often it comprises millions of lines of code and the, um, the context window or the uh, amount of information that current models can pay attention to at any given time to make decisions uh, is just insufficient yet for the largest code bases. But I mean, you know, Google's Gemini 1.5 Pro model has a 2 million token context window. So call it 1.5 million words, about 10,000 lines of code. Um, so, you know, you're like, we're starting to see that. And there are new architectures 
that are coming out, Samba and Mamba, other types of architectures that are demonstrating um, orders of magnitude, larger capability in terms of the size of the context that it can source from in order to make inferences or, you know, solve problems or write code. So, you know, it's just a matter of time before we get there. The challenge with extending AI into other domains at the moment is that the AIs are currently, call it the best ones, are they kind of get tasks right about 95% of the time, right? Which sounds great, but for complex tasks, what typically happens is you've, you've got an agent that goes and it runs a step of the task and it returns some information or some inferences and then it passes it along to another agent. An agent is just like a, a call to ChatGPT or Claude, whatever. Um, and where that agent typically has a specific, it's, it's built to have a specific function, right? So maybe one agent is really good at figuring out search queries and going out to Google and bringing back information. And it's giving it a hand it off to another agent that is very good at identifying out of the large set that the original agent brought back, it's very good at identifying which segments of that set are most relevant to the problem. And then it's going to hand that off, that smaller set off to an agent that's going to do some work that requires some information, right? So whatever. Now you've got kind of three steps. The thing is, after kind of 10 steps, you've got a 50% failure rate because that 5% failure rate compounds at each step, right? So what you kind of need are agents that are able, that have kind of like a 99.9% .9 uh, success rate on each task. And that way, as it's passed along, now there are ways to ameliorate these. There are some unbelievably complex agent models that have some de deterministic steps and some agent-like steps. We're able to get really long way on complex tasks, um, despite the kind of 95% success rate. For example, if you kind of know what the desired state is at any given milestone along the way, then you can course correct. But anyway, there's, there's a bunch of different directions here, but mm, eventually you're going to have agents that are going to be able to be much better than humans at, for example, fund accounting, tax accounting, um, evaluating legal contracts, um, developing cases for litigation or defenses for litigation, performing uh, financial analysis for the purpose of, of portfolio allocation, of security selection, et cetera. And the, the progress in robotics, which is increasingly using a lot of the same uh, learning architectures that we've discovered are most effective for the building of large language models. Um, we're just seeing unbelievable progress in the robotics domain as well. And so, you know, once we get robots that are able to, you know, effectively empty the dishwasher, do the dishes, prepare a meal, uh, once you've got cars that are able to go and drive your kids from school to activities or, you know, what have you, like, we're very close. You know, when I say very close, we're sort of like a matter of maybe one or two years from seeing uh, tech that is able to effectively take on these kinds of tasks at or better than and more reliably than um, humans, right? And this is just going to expand at an exponential uh, rate because we're able to use AIs and robots to build better AIs and robots. So you, you eventually end up on this sort of double exponential uh, curve of, of development, right? And so this is the type of change that I think that we all need to be prepared for, right? And why I think that the most important skill for, um, for people who are going to be active in the labor force um, at all over the next, you know, 5, 10, 20, 50 years uh, is going to be the ability to 
have self-long learning, be self, self-curious and self-motivated to innovate, make improvements, to have ideas and work with AIs to bring those innovative ideas into operation and production um, because we're no longer handicapped. Right now, we're no longer handicapped by not knowing front-end coding skills or coding skills to prototype applications in most um, development languages, right? That is no longer a barrier. It's no longer really a barrier uh, to write complex documents, right? I mean, a, a group out of Japan has now dropped an open source repo where they demonstrate how to write scientific papers, right? So test, generate hypotheses, uh, write the code, gather the data, run the analyses to test the hypotheses, generate, you know, summary tables and, and, uh, and graphs, charts, make inferences from the tables, charts, and summary outputs, and then actually write a complex scientific paper um, and then do that iteratively. So you've tested one hypothesis, you've got an outcome. What other hypotheses are, are, are inferred or implied by this new information that we've gathered? Let's go test these other hypotheses and show how this compounds over time into automated scientific research and discovery, right? So, you know, we're already sort of at this stage and it's not long before this extends into virtually every area of the labor market, in my opinion. Yeah, it's interesting. Like when you hear the really good VCs, I've listened to some of them on podcasts, like that robotics thing is something they're talking about a lot. They're saying it's coming faster than you think. It's going to be bigger than you think. Like it's going to be a huge part. These robots are going to be doing things that we don't think are imaginable right now in a shorter time period than we think is possible. Oh yeah, I completely agree. The other thing I thought was interesting though is... uh uh, at the end of the podcast with Aswath, they had, you know, he's done, he does those de these detailed valuations of companies. And one of the computer science professors at NYU basically made a bot of him, um, took everything he's ever done, because all his classes are online, took every class, right. everything he's written on his blog, took everything, and they're competing. He's competing against five of the students right now um, to see, can the bot do better valuations than he can? And, and he, he wrote this blog post, Aswath did. He's asking himself this question all the time now what can I do that my bot can't? And like, that's stuck with me ever since the podcast. Like it's something we probably all should be asking ourselves because he's thinking like, what, if this bot's gonna be able to do this. Like, what does it mean for me? And, and I'm thinking the same thing with everything I do. Like, we probably should all be asking ourselves this question. Like, what can I do that my bot can't do? I completely agree. I love that Dr. Damodaran is doing this. Um, it's the kind of experiment that only a tenured professor can run, right? Where, you know, he, he's not, he's not threatened by, by AI, right? Um, if he's made obsolete, you know, whatever, he can, he can do almost anything and still get paid for it, right? So, um, you know, only a tenured professor can really run that kind of experiment, but uh, it is astonishing the number of tasks that we are able to get mostly done in our area of expertise um, that, you know, we, we can get done by AI now uh, using fairly simple agent models. And in some case, just a single call to the language model. Um, and that scope is going to widen at a double exponential rate. So um, yeah, absolutely. We all should be asking the question, what can I be learning about doing or thinking about being innovative for um, that the bots are unlikely to catch up to me on? And um, how can I best be making use of this tech to give me the time to think about and, and innovate and create new ways of, of doing new things? Well, Adam, thank you. As is usually the case when you come on, I could have gone for three hours here and we, we wouldn't have run out of things to talk about, but we have to cut it at some point. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, if people want to find out more about you, about return stack ETFs, where can they go? I am at, at gestaltu.com on, or sorry, at gestaltu rather on Twitter um, to find out more about 
Resolve, investresolve.com. We are a, a co-manager of the return stacked ETFs. Learn all about the return stacking concept at returnstacked.com and learn all about the ETFs at returnstackedetfs.com. And uh, feel free to email me or anyone else on the team if you have any questions or want to figure out how these can be useful in your portfolios. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks so much for the great questions. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.